gathering special forces from nine European countries in the Sahel, which is a remarkable and concrete example of Europeans taking their responsibilities by accompanying the Malian armed forces in combat. This task force has already achieved major successes against terrorism. And this is not only a European success story. This is a success story that we share with you as the US support to our operations in the Sahel is crucial. This will still be the case as we are transforming the layout of, of forces in the region in order to focus more on operational partnerships and cooperation with G5 Sahel nations. For many years, France and the US have had an operational honeymoon. In the Middle East, within the global coalition to defeat ISIS, France is set the second contributor. Also in the Indo-Pacific, where our forces train together, or when it comes to uphold international law, as shown during joint and combined operation conducted by US, UK, and France against the chemical facilities in Syria in 2018. Our operational cooperation delivers concrete results and it will continue to deliver. You know what they say about the United States and France, that we are the oldest allies. In fact, we celebrated our historic bond on Wednesday by honoring the 240th anniversary of the Battle of Yorktown with a joint flight over the city by Rafale fighters and F-22 Raptors. I'm convinced that this idea of the oldest ally is not only a kind word that is said automatically during these ceremonies. I believe it is a strong reality. France is sometimes seen as the hitching powder of the alliance. A famous interview by President Macron in October 2019 triggered a tempest in a teapot. But the truth is that we, he was asking questions that many were keeping for themselves. And at the end of the day, it helped to launch a reflection process that proved extremely useful to put back notions such as solidarity or responsibility at the heart of the alliance. Coming back to France and the US, we turn out to be your best allies in achieving your goals because we show up. We show up everywhere there is a need against terrorism in the Indo-Pacific where 1.6 million of French people live, in the cyberspace and in outer space. We are the ones who push Europe to act more and we do our part. Beyond our operational cooperation, we share a common analysis of the threats and strategic issues we face, among which, of course, the rise of China. The nature of the power competition that is unfolding is a crucial issue for France. China's intent to exert a greater influence on the global stage has triggered some disruptive effects and changed the power distribution in a way that could be detrimental to our own interests. The extension of its ambitions beyond its regional periphery, its substantial, its substantial investments in operational armed forces with an expeditionary capability, the construction of its naval base in Djibouti, or the development of its ballistic arsenal and naval capacities changed the scope 
and the nature of the challenge. Moreover, while its public nuclear doctrine remains centered on no first use, the rapid development of China's deterrent capabilities raises questions. One argument among many that call for the preservation of a strong and clear deterrence doctrine in Washington, as well as in Paris. So my presence here in Washington offers me the perfect opportunity to reaffirm the crucial importance of our bilateral defense relationship. Its depth and scope are simply breathtaking. I was delighted to engage with Secretary Austin at the Pentagon. It was a dense meeting which enabled us to exchange our views on a broad range of issues. I was delighted to visit US Cybercom this morning. Cyber is a key field in which we are enhancing our relationship. And space is also a domain where we want to cooperate more. By the way, we had a very fruitful meeting with General Dickinson from US Spacecom in Paris a couple of weeks ago. Finally, I would like to stress our excellent cooperation in the field of special operations. Indeed, I'm delighted to announce that this morning, Secretary Austin and I signed a roadmap to strengthen even more the relationship between our two special forces. America is back. Now let's get to work and we will deliver. Our bound is unbreakable as President Roosevelt framed it in his 1942 message to the French people. No two nations exist which are more united by historic and mutually friendly ties than the people of France and the United States. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister Parley. That was an excellent statement and you made some news with an announcement of the special operations agreement. Um, I think we have until four o'clock, so we have about a half an hour to talk through lots of issues and some questions. And for those at home, there's a small audience here, but no live questions. There are some pre-recorded from Atlantic Council members that we'll try to get to at the end. Um, I'm hoping we'll talk about a lot of these issues, including um, building European strategic autonomy and that a very French-centered effort, the American reception to that idea about counterterrorism, about Indo-PACOM space, we'll go through them all. But perhaps maybe let's start with the news of the day. Um, the, the agreement that you announced on, with Special Operations Forces, I assume, has much to do with the Sahel operations mm -hmm. and President Macron's announcement this morning that going forward, the, the number of French forces would be roughly halved. And I believe the intent is that, or the hope is that other nations will fill in the need that is still there. Explain uh, more the details of why that decision was made and perhaps what was the reception uh, from Secretary Austin this morning? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to highlight one major fact. We are not leaving the Sahel. And uh, we will keep on fighting terrorism in this area. And I will come back to the reason why we want to do so. Um, so we should not focus too much on the figures. Uh, yes, we are uh, a bit more than 5,000 French soldiers uh, in the field. And at the end of the process, we'll be around 2,500 or 3,000. It's not completely decided yet. But this is not the most important uh, uh, fact. Um, President Macron's decision was not driven by the idea of having less uh, French soldiers in the field. President Macron uh, was absolutely convinced that uh, we had to adapt our military layout as the terrorist groups also adapt their behavior. And more than that, 
because what we have started with our Sahelian friends, the Sahelian armed forces on the one hand, and with our uh, partners, mainly the European partners on the other hand, change uh, a bit the game. Why? Because since early 2020, um, President Macron asked a major question to our uh, Sahelian partners. He asked them again, do you want us to be in your country? Do you want us to continue helping and supporting you in your fight against terrorism? This is the basis. We are not there because we want to be there. We are there because those countries ask us to be there. And since then, we have started a process in which the Sahelian forces are not only trained from the very beginning of the training, but they are engaged in military operations, shoulder to shoulder with uh, the French uh, armed forces, and uh, success in a sex successful manner. At the end of 2020, uh, we had major military operations involving 3,000 soldiers, half were Sahelian, half were French. And these operations was very successful by combining uh, capabilities that did not exist before in the Sahelian armed forces. So a step has been made in the uh, Sahelian armed forces capabilities. And we have to take that into account because it is a very positive step. And on the other hand, what do we see? We see that more Europeans are in the field uh, with us. More than 3,000 European soldiers are in the Sahel. So sometimes I, I hear that uh, there are no Europeans uh, uh, in the field. This is not true. And the number uh, is growing. And we have created a new tool. Uh, I mean the Takuba Task Force um, that uh, will enhance the um, Sahelian Armed Forces cap capabilities by accompanying them in fighting uh, terrorist groups. So this reshuffling or transformation of this uh, Barkhane operation, does it mean that we are disengaging from Sahel, nor disengaging from counterterrorism operation? We still uh, look at targeting the leaders of the uh, terrorist groups which are present in the area, I mean ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And again, we made uh, major uh, operations against those leaders. Uh, looking back to where we were a year ago, we have neutralized uh, quite a number of them, which does not mean that the, the fight against those group is over, but which means that what we do is efficient. And the American participation or, or what, what they're able to offer, uh, are you, is France getting what it needs from the United States? Is it, what, what more can you say about this agreement today, for example, that's new, um, that you're not, you weren't getting before or, or what extent, what it extends? We uh, can rely on a strong support from the United States, uh, especially in the uh, counterterrorism operations I just mentioned. Uh, we benefit from um, uh, American assets, uh, such as uh, ISR uh, means, uh, which are particularly uh, useful uh, to get the right information uh, intelligence on those groups. And uh, during my uh, meeting uh, with uh, Secretary Austin, I referred to uh, the efficiency and the strong need for the future uh, of this uh, support. So um, 
I, I know, and he, uh, Secretary Austin said that uh, he was reviewing the global posture. Right. Um, and uh, so I felt very important for him to know that we continue relying on this uh, uh, very specific uh, US assets which at the end makes the difference. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you about this particular case, but also the larger question I mentioned earlier about European strategic autonomy, because they're both a little bit one and the same. And the, and the idea of how much um, American public, French public, other European publics support foreign intervention, foreign military action, uh, stronger militaries, bigger defense spending, um, which the French are asking for, um, and the Americans are asking for, but in very specific ways, right? So this this is a week where the United States and President Biden announces the end of, Af of Afghanistan, which follows pulling out of Syria and pulling out of, of Somalia forces, at least in the last administration. Um, how how do you see that our French publics, European publics, or American publics are these are they supportive of these ideas of? still being engaged in the Sahel at, or, or increasing at higher levels, as you're saying? Well, I will speak for Europeans, mm. uh, if you don't mind. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, French people uh, was directly uh, hit by terrorist attacks uh, on its territory. So in 2015, uh, we suffered from terrible uh, terrorist attacks. So from that moment, um, as from that moment, um, the, we, we, we have been benefiting from a strong support mm. of public opinion to uh, fight against those who were responsible for these attacks. And uh, at that time, those persons were located and based uh, in Syria and Iraq. And uh, we, we were uh, very conscious that this ability to prepare from outside uh, terrorist attacks that will hit, that would hit uh, the French territory was really crucial. So um, since then, um, um, the political authorities in France decided to uh, stop uh, um, shrinking uh, the uh, defense budgets because it, it, it was a, a, right. a trend uh, coming from the end of, of the 19th century <laughs> and uh, since the end of, Cold, of the Cold War. And so we started to, to resume our effort to increase uh, our investment in uh, defense budgets. And President Macron decided to enhance and to boost this uh, defense uh, uh, effort as we have a budget programming law, uh, sorry, a military programming law, uh, which plans to reach the 2% GDP target in 2025. And we are on track uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this goal. The question was also how uh, the, the French public opinion and the European public opinion react uh, to that and to that move. In France, I did not notice any uh, negative um, reaction, main negative reaction, for the reason I just mentioned. There is an understanding that uh, what we do is something that will protect uh, our citizens. And there is also uh, a, a common understanding that uh, uh, the threat is not coming uh, only from uh, Syria or Iraq, but the threat is also developing from other areas and Sahel is the southern border of Europe. And uh, um, the uh, Europeans are more and more conscious that uh, their security is at stake, not only on the eastern flank of Europe, but also on the southern flank on Europe, in Europe, of Europe, sorry. And that's why 
we benefit from uh, the contribution of countries such as uh, um, Estonia, uh, the Czech Republic uh, uh, in the Takuba force. Um, we would not benefit from this contribution if there would not uh, if those countries would not have developed uh, a, a right consciousness of the threat that might come from the uh, uh, southern part of the world. Well, so on Europe's strategic autonomy and the idea of European defense, uh, talk to us about how far along you think this is from becoming a reality and what's necessary. What does the end point look like? Is there a point where Europeans will be able to say, we've done it. Is it a new agreement? Is it a new institution? Is it new levels of spending and hardware? Um, you know, you said in your in your in your speech here that much more needed to be done. What more what more do you think needs to be done? What are those steps and and particularly for the United States to to support to be involved in? I think that uh, uh, it's a combination of uh, continuous uh, increasing investments in defense because uh, in average, we are far from the two percent uh, target, even if we are improving as Europeans. And it's uh, also uh, a question of, uh, are we able to act in the field? And um, there, uh, there are uh, European countries that are not only able, but that are willing to act. And this is this move that uh, we want to, um, encourage to support and that we are doing uh, uh, in practical terms in the Sahel. Uh, I mentioned the Takuba force. We have uh, eight European countries involved mm. in the Takuba force, but we have also nine uh, Euro other European countries which want to enter uh, this uh, Takuba force which give you uh, the signal that there is a willingness to do more because investing is of course uh, uh, necessary, but it's not enough. If you want to be a player, if you want to contribute to your own security, then you have to be able to act. And that's exactly, I think, what the United States requests from the Europeans. Can, can your, there's a bit of a paradox, I think, European autonomy needs some kind of US support because a lot of the hardware is gonna come from the United States, right? The autonomy does not mean that we do not need to be supported. We do not need to cooperate with others. Looking at where we were, Looking at where we are, we see that there is a long way to go to autonomy. So there is room for cooperation, uh, in my view, in the future. Can I then can I ask for your thoughts on the recent announcement? The Swiss uh, have chosen the F-35 for their next fighter jet, not the Rafale or, or the others on the table. How much is that a concern uh, for for you, for France, for the idea of European autonomy? Well, I would not comment a sovereign decision. And we know that uh, okay, with thanks. the United States, uh, uh, we may be sometimes in a position to be competitors, especially in, in the field of uh, defense industries. But uh, this is a Swiss decision, that's it. Swiss decision. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, I want to take a, a question from Atlanta Council's Anna Wieslander. Um, and I was reading ahead of time, she noted, in, and you mentioned yourself, the, what it's still, what would it take for the European, for Europeans to be able to defend themselves, the long way to go. And a, a quote that I noticed was, she says, the gap between current resources and capabilities that would allow the European allies to at least prevail in a limited regional war against a peer adversary are estimated, this is a double I double S estimate, at between 288 billion and $357 billion, according to a study. So before I get to her question, what's the 
political timeline of, I mean, what's the reality of how, how long it would take to get to that level to equip, train, field? You said it's, it's, it's still a, a, in the distant. Is this five years, 10 years, 25 years? Is this a generational change? Um, sorry not to, to share uh, your view. Uh, I think that our common challenge today is to be able to face um, the competition coming from uh, very strong powers, international or regional powers. So we have to improve our capabilities, and when I say our, uh, it's of course the European capabilities, but we have also collectively to improve those capabilities. So I will not make any comment on the American capabilities, of course, but I think that we have to continue thinking in terms of cooperation. And that's exactly uh, the, the spirit of, of NATO and uh, uh, NATO, the NATO alliance uh, remains the cornerstone of European security. So I'm not thinking in terms of what can we do on our own. I think we have to uh, um, bring um, a stronger contribution to the alliance, to the NATO alliance, and by building up our military, uh, European military, then and our, by increasing our military investments, we directly contribute to the efficiency of NATO in an environment where the tensions between strong powers is increasing. So you, yeah, you, you see things trending positive, the budgets, the political will, the public opinion, yes. all going well. Let's uh, then take this question from the Atlanta Council, I believe coming up this way from Anna Wieslander. Well, hello, I'm Anna Wieslander, Director uh, for Northern Europe at the Atlantic Council, and I head the Stockholm office, which we have been running for the past five years. So even though the Atlantic Council is a DC-based uh, think tank, we also have a strong footprint uh, and outreach in Europe. And one of the issues that I have been following closely is uh, EU-NATO cooperation. And uh, I was delighted when uh, the US just recently was accepted as a partner to the PESCO project, uh, Military Mobility, a flagship uh, project, which is uh, crucial in order to uh, secure the reinforcement, uh, not least of the Eastern flank, uh, which is of importance to the security in Northern Europe. So uh, um, also at the same time, uh, we have had uh, a lot of friction when it comes to third country participation in the EU PESCO projects. And uh, with uh, the recent change of tone uh, from the Biden administration, uh, when it comes to this, uh, and also within uh, uh, Europe, uh, I would like to hear uh, the French position on US participation in PESCO projects moving forward. What is the right uh, balance there, since uh, there is also some degree of need for, for independence for Europe moving forward? Well, uh, you're right. Uh, there is a, a shift uh, in the way the US with uh, this new administration uh, understand uh, EU initiatives in the field of defense. And this is uh, very positive in my view, because uh, seeing uh, European efforts on one side and uh, uh, um, uh, a NATO um, loyalty to, uh, on the other hand, uh, is not the, the, the best uh, and most efficient way to uh, improve um, our necessary cooperation. So I think that uh, having uh, the US uh, in some PESCO projects uh, sounds very positive. And you mentioned uh, the uh, m military uh, mobility, and it's obvious that uh, if we want to have a, 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 an efficient uh, NATO, we need to be able to move troops from one country to another 
in an uh, efficient way, which is not the case uh, today. So uh, it requests from uh, uh, European countries, uh, uh, on the first hand, uh, major investment. But I think this is, this is for the sake of uh, NATO's efficiency. So it's good to have uh, the United States uh, on board. Uh, now we have to, to make sure that uh, the mechanism we have initiated at uh, uh, the European level um, plays uh, fully their role. And I'm sure that you will share on the same view than I, that the, the European uh, money and fundings um, should not be directed to uh, um, non-European uh, industries or countries. So we have to make sure that we can go further in this cooperation, which is a, 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 a positive asset, without destroying the uh, first tools we have uh, initiated at European level. Do not forget that uh, the European fund is just starting. Do not forget that uh, the PESCO projects uh, are quite uh, new. Uh, they have started in 2017, which is very recent. So we have to, to uh, consolidate uh, those tools to make sure that, uh, again, Europeans uh, play their role and uh, uh, contribute uh, uh, sufficiently uh, to um, the, uh, the security of uh, the European continent. We know that today the first contributor remains the United States. And we understand um, the uh, American expectation that the Europeans take a greater part uh, that is called the burden sharing. We understand that fully. So after a long process, maybe too long, we have decided to start uh, investing in, in our uh, industrial uh, defense uh, um, companies, uh, uh, projects. So I think it is positive for everybody. So we have to make sure that these tools work. So good. Uh, I think we're at our, our time. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. <laughs> of course. I'll send it to Ben. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you so much, uh, Minister Pardee, for being with us once again at the Atlantic Council to make the case for a strong and united Europe uh, on defense as a, a key partner and ally to the United States. This is a case that we will make with you here at the Europe Center where we've uh, said before that European responsibility in defense, European strategic autonomy is an asset for NATO and uh, the transatlantic relationship. We were glad to hear uh, of your successful uh, trip here to Washington with this uh, announcement of a uh, new agreement on special operations between the United States and uh, France, and we'll obviously be continuing to follow uh, closely. Uh, please go to our website, see our work on this. We've published a great report by Olivier Remibel and Jeff Lightfoot called Sovereign Solidarity, making the case for a core uh, Franco-American defense and security uh, relationship. Uh, we'll be here uh, at the Europe Center. Join us next week uh, on the 16th for a conversation with the Lithuanian uh, foreign minister and looking forward, Mr. Paris, to Host you again on your next visit. Hey everyone, luckily on set.